Welcome to Thoughts on Thursday. It's Reverend Miller and Stuart Holmes. <laughs> We're glad that you could join us as we prepare for our Sunday worship. It is a busy time here at Old Paramus with our annual, I think, 149th annual Harvest Fair this Saturday, November 6th. We open the doors at 10 a.m. and we close the doors at 4 p.m. If you're looking for treasures, come join us. On the 7th, will be All Saints Sunday. So November 1st is All Saints Day. We celebrate All Saints Day on Sunday. So it's All Saints Sunday. And it's been our tradition for the last nine years to read all the saints who have gone on to glory in the past year and light a candle. And then we also, once we've lit a candle for each one of them, we lift up all the names of those who have passed on into heaven, even maybe 20, 30 years ago, and light a candle in their memory. And lighting a candle is not a big, big thing. We might light candles all the time, but it's just a simple act to, to remember someone, but also to be reminded that uh, in darkness, there can be the light of Christ. And when we think about and reflect on mourning the loss of a loved one, there's darkness involved there, but God's light can still be with us and sustain us in our time of sorrow. And that's what, really what the candle is all about. And it's interesting, we've been the last few weeks looking at worship and how COVID-19 has kind of maybe emphasized or shed a light on certain things that were probably already happening in the making. And one of those things I want to talk today about is that, speaking of All Saints Day and the feeling of loss, the church has been declining. Not just old Paramus, but the whole Christian church in the United States and really in North America. And they did a, a study that has just come out, but really the findings, the findings came out now, but the uh, polling happened before. But prior to last year, the last few years, so to speak, there was always more people in the United States who were, went to a house of worship, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, uh, Buddhist, Hindu on a regular basis. They went more than once or twice per year. And it was about 54% to about 45%. In the last few years that has flipped. So 54% of the people do not go to a house of worship on a regular basis or more than twice a year. And uh, so 45% go on a regular basis. That's a new change. And that was the findings happen now, but they polled a few years ago, really. And so that happened before COVID. COVID has shut down churches. And so less people have gone to church. And so people have been afraid, has COVID just accelerated that? And will we, will we recover our numbers? Or will people just say, hey, it's pretty easy not to go to church and we'll keep going? that comes back to our technology and the question, is an online service as good as an in-person service? Can it sustain faith and can that be counted? And so that also leads to the next question, which we've been kind of talking about is, as we move forward and we are able to be in person and we continue to do online, how will we view the online worship? To ask it another way, will we tape an in-person service and put it online, or will our service be a combination of in-person and online? What does that mean? Well, if you do Facebook Live, which we're th thinking about, people can make comments in person, live, all across the world. And so some churches have the pastor with the uh, 
Facebook Live and you could ask a question and that pastor would answer. That person could be hundreds of miles away or just down the street, but not in person. And that would be a way of interacting between both. But it also goes to the idea of what does a worship service look like? It might look different if you're watching it online and are we going to accommodate that and then maybe even sacrifice some of the in-person? And so that's what we're wrestling with. We don't have all those answers as we, we look into the future. And that goes back to the question of length. Do we keep it shorter if we're going to do both? Do we bring it back to that, that mythical one-hour <laughs> worship service that was the standard long ago? And so as we look in the future, both technology and COVID and worship trends will have an impact on our worship. And... I'll make a little plug for us here at Old Paramus in a, month, a week and a half, I guess, on November 14th, we're going to be having a discussion after worship where we re look at, can we rearrange this organ pulpit area to better accommodate both a video and also the choir if we have to distance because of COVID. And so we're looking at what it would look like maybe in the future. So. Not only am I asking questions, we're trying to answer those and we're doing that really as a community. So if you're part of Old Paramus, make sure to come on November 14th to be a part of that discussion. I keep trying to go longer than Stuart, so I just keep talking, <laughs> but now it's Stuart's time. To... Time! <laughs> <laughs> now you're talking about uh, lo re-looking at this space. We're, um, we were talking before we started to tape about this is kind of a unique situation here. The choir is in this box uh, that is surrounded by walls um, and it, it kind of restricts how we're going to be able to move or sit. Uh, the choir coming back in a couple weeks, we hope. Uh, you know, people are nervous and uh, being able to sit um, in a COVID uh, in a positive way so that they don't get nervous about COVID uh, is, is a challenge. And uh, it's important to understand that uh, people really want to come back to, the choir members really want to come back to sing. In fact, our congregation, as you pointed out before, um, wants the choir back too. But it's easier said than done. And, and uh, it's difficult to uh, kind of work through that and figure out how we're gonna do this um, at least until COVID is no longer part of our lexicon. And that's, I mean, it's overused, uh, that phrase, the new normal. Yeah. There's a desire to always go back to the way we used to have it, and we appreciate. As we move and make choices, we won't be going back to the way we were because not everyone's ready to come back and sing. So, you know, hypothetically, you, Stuart, could have a choir of all baritones. They're the only ones who want to come back. You know, some of the things we had before will be missing. And there's a sense of kind of working with that. Getting into it, right. Yes, right. and seeing, and, and as even we've discovered doing this, we've learned more about technology, and sometimes it doesn't work. We're gonna discover as even we come in person, some things will work and some things won't, we have to adjust. So adjustments will always have to be made, maybe forever. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? So music this Sunday, um, putting this, this whole discussion of, of uh, COVID related items. Music this Sunday, I started out playing uh, Floor Painters uh, for All the Saints, it's a variation, uh, everybody, not everybody, a lot of people think that if we're all the saints, you should, should have a great big, oh, this is a saint of the church and everything. Floor Peters, who's a uh, uh, Belgium composer, uh, comes up with this beautiful lilting melody that, um, that kind of rolls through and kind of in a uh, meditative way. So that's the prelude. Postlude today, last Sunday, I played uh, uh, before the service, before the service started, I played Bach's 
uh, Takata and Fugue in uh, D minor. Everybody knows that from... But uh, Bach paired that toccata, which means a freestyle, basically, lots of runs and uh, uh, passages with arpeggios. Uh, he paired that with a fugue. That was a common practice in Bach's day. Uh, he often paired prelude and post and uh, fugue together. So you had the prelude and fugue and whatever. Uh, that fugue was much more regimented. It was the, uh, the Dutch approach to, this is the way you should do it. A uh, few, uh, the, the um, restrictions on, on where you go and, and how you get there are, are pretty well set. Uh, that doesn't mean that he doesn't take a piece out of the prelude, uh, or the, in our case, the toccata, so you had. As, as a beginning, and then you have the fugue, which is, as I said, much more regimented. That's the theme of the fugue, which is basically taken from the toccata. A fugue is like, a, um, I've said this often before, is like a uh, relay race. You start out with a runner, he takes a baton, runs around, gives a baton to somebody else. Um, and that fugue is what's going to be happening here. And so I'm just going to end with just a, uh, two entrances of that fugue. There's the theme. takes up that fugue. So um, he's done a marvelous thing. The last, uh, with this Toccata and Fugue, the last thing I want to say is uh, there is some discussion among musicologists that, that the uh, Toccata and Fugue in D minor wasn't really Bach. There's no proof. We don't have a manuscript from Bach on this. Um, if it was from Bach, and I think the prevailing feeling is yes, um, but it had to be very early Bach. And, um, his fugue is very clear. I even use it to teach kids what a fugue is because it's so clear when those voices come in. Um, but it's an exciting piece to play. So that's the postlude for All today. Right. The other half of the Bach. So perfect. And I, I even do this, I will confess, we often don't even include the fugue in the name. Oh, you're playing the toccata. But right. it's the toccata and fugue. Right, it would be, to, it's really a toccata and fugue. Yes, but a lot of times people just, the fugue doesn't get uh, a lot of props. Yeah, and <laughs> it's harder to listen to and harder to play. Okay. And I'm going to end with um, the very ending of that fugue, which goes back to the idea of the uh, toccata, which is unusual for, for a toccata and fugue. Bach didn't do that a lot. All right. Well, thank you for joining us on Thoughts on Thursday. We hope to see you either or both November 6th for the Harvest Fair or November 7th for our All Saints Day Sunday worship at 10 a.m. Thanks and have a great day.